Can't tell you how good it is to be here again. See, H. Spurgeon said that the road of sorrow is the road to heaven. But there are wells of refreshing water all along the route. And this is one of those wells. Praise God. My subject this morning is when, the lo when God's love is perfected in us. And let's turn to 1 John, and I'd like to read a few passages that use this phrase. And I want you to think as we read the scripture about what this means, that the love of God is perfected in us. I don't know if you've given much thought to it, or if you've heard much preaching about it, but the love of God is to be perfected in us. Perfected. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Amen. Chapter 4 and verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Amen. His love is perfected in us. Amen. Down to verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Mm -hmm. It was about 19 years ago that I sat on the floor in my apartment in Port Huron, Michigan, just weeping. My failure to please God had been increasing my conviction of my own sin had been growing to a great measure over the last while and I kept knowing that I needed to change. I kept knowing that I need to do better. I knew I was living the way I shouldn't live and I was crying out to God wondering what is it going to take to turn me around. And I would try and make some commitment to try and do better. And then I would fail and fall deeper into sin. And it was at that time that I was crying out to God and crying and finally at the point of breaking and saying, God, I can't do it. And do you know what the Lord said to me? The Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, I love you. It so surprised me that he would love me after all I had done. And he was saying to me, it's about time you got here. I've been waiting for you to realize that you can't do it. And his love transformed my life. His love had a transforming effect on my life. And as dramatic as it was, his love was not finished with me yet. It had just begun. And God's love is not finished with you yet. Amen. If you are born again, then there was a time when God's love drew you. God's love captured your heart. Now Jesus said that no man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. And so the Father drew you. Yes. His love 
appealed to your heart and drew you to himself. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And you heard the message of the cross of Christ and you saw the love of God hanging on the cross. And you knew it was for you and God's love transformed you and changed you. But God's love was not finished with you yet. There is more work to be done, brethren. Amen. Do you think it's easy for God to get you to heaven? I'm speaking as a man as if something were hard for God, but there's a lot of effort involved in getting you to heaven. There's a lot of work to be done. And the way that God does it, the way that God transforms you into the image of his son is he puts his love within you. Amen. And that love, like leaven, is going to work through the whole lump. And it's going to transform your life and it's going to make people like Jesus. Many in the church have the view that once someone is in, the work is over. There. They're saved. But God does not see things this way. There is urgent, critical work to be done in order to transform the believer into the image of Christ. Yes. Amen. Into a being capable of living in God's presence. Amen. And reigning in heaven. That, brethren, is a lot of work. Amen. Brethren, uh, we were pretty ugly when we first came to know the Lord. Just to be honest about it, God's got a lot of work to do. And it says in the scripture we're reading that God's love can be perfected within us. Amen. Part of the work that God has to do in us is perfecting of our love. And I believe that this is the foundation upon which all other work is to be done. When love is laid as the foundation, then we can start building something good. Yes. Amen. Yes. And if love is not the foundation, it doesn't matter really what you build. Yes. Amen. Clanging symbol. Something is lacking in man. Something is not right. Something within us is missing that makes the whole human race not function at all. James said, from whence come wars and fightings within you? On a universal scale, jealousy, envy, bitterness, hatred, malice, murders, and wars. This is the rule in this world. These are all proof that love is missing from within us. We, are, we have a void within us, an emptiness. Without this love within us, this part that is missing, we are but a shell, agitated and churning and restless and unsettled. And God wants to come and put his love in that emptiness. Yes. And let it flow up and overflow unto others. Well, God will fix what is lacking in the believer, but it does not happen automatically at our baptism. Amen. God will put his love in us, and it will work like leaven. Love is to be perfected in this life. You know, I know there are many areas where we are not perfected. Even Paul, the apostle Paul, he said, not as though I had already attained or either were already perfect, but he was following after. There are many areas where we will not be perfected, but in the love of God is to be perfected in our lives. This is why he gave some apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God's love begins its work in us when we hear the gospel, and whether we realize it or not, it continues to exert its transforming influence upon us. His love will not stop until it is complete, having transformed us into a vessel unto honor. God's love is persistent. 
and he will do it. He has promised. Perfected in us. Now this word perfected the King James uses, it just means completed. Here's the problem. Truth doesn't change. Truth is conveyed through words, but words change. Words change and lose their meaning. There was a time when gay was a good thing. So what has happened in this word perfected, it means the completion of what is lacking. And what this says is that there is an objective to God's love. Amen. He has a purpose for which his love is working. Amen. Love is a powerful force and never more powerful than when it is the pure, infinite, unbounded love of God. Right. And this powerful force is at work in us, accomplishing feats which could never be achieved by fear or threats. You think of how Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and it seemed to him but a few days for the love that he had to her. See, love, love can make us obey in a way we could never obey by command Amen. or threat or fear. And so this is God's way of making children. He puts his love within us and causes us to walk in his ways. So there's a perfecting process that must be done. It is the completion of what is lacking. Therefore, if there is any lack of evidence of God's love within you, well, God's love has not yet finished what it intends to accomplish. Remember, Jesus took this blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And he spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him. And then he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. The work wasn't perfected yet. After that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. When God touches you in salvation, that's the first work. And God has more work to do. He wants to complete this work of love. Yes, amen. Just as the stones for the temple had all the work to be done before they were brought to the temple site, out in the quarry, there was the chisel yes. and the hammer and the finishing of the stone, perfecting of the stone to make it ready to be useful in the temple of God. This is what God is doing in us. And as Isaiah stood before the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and they, they cried, holy, holy, holy. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And so what did God do? God touched his lips with a coal from the altar. We also need a coal from the altar to touch our hearts. But this is an amazing thing, God's love in us. Have you ever thought about this? God putting his love in us. We live in a world characterized by hatred. Cain, who was of that wicked one, he rose up and slew his brother. It says, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Right at the start, the first death was a murder. The earth has been filled with violence ever since. God even washed away the violence in the flood of Noah's day, and the cycle just began again. Violence filled the earth. But dawning upon the darkness of this world, Jesus Christ came preaching good news. He burst upon the scene saying, I have good news. And his good news that he wants to put God's love within us. Now this is an amazing scripture in John chapter 17 and verse 26. Jesus praying to the Father said, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. 
that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus is praying for us that God's love would be in us, the same love that he loved the Son. Jesus revealing the Father to us opens the door for his love to enter into us, the same love wherewith the Father loved the Son. Amen. Amen. So nigh, so very nigh to God, I cannot nearer be. For in the person of his Son, I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God, more dear I cannot be. The love wherewith he loves the Son, such is his love to me. The Father loves us as he loves the Son. But you don't, unless I missed it, you don't hear anything about God putting his love in people in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. It said that the Lord set his love upon them. Remember, he said he didn't set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. The Lord loved them and he set his love upon them. But now he's going to put his love within us. What I'm saying, brethren, is it shows when the love of God is in you or not. Amen. Jesus was keenly aware of this when the Jews, he was speaking to them. He said, I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Yes. Yes. Jesus could look at the evidence and say, I know there's not the love of God in them. And we are not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. Amen. This is evidence. And whoever has this world's good and goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Amen. You look at this evidence and you say, no love of God there. Mm -hmm. But no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Mm -hmm. God put his love within us. Amen. This is a marvelous thing. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now we connect this God is love with God in us, and we have God's love in us. What we're really speaking about is God dwelling within the believer. And what we're saying is that when God dwells in the believer, it has an effect. Amen. It has an effect that can be seen. Amen. A verse that just transformed my view of God this last year was when Paul was on Mars Hill and he said, God is not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Does it seem as though God is far from you? Everybody move your arm. Move your arm. In him we live and move and have our being. God is right here. Amen. Amen. He's not far from every one of you. He's with us. And if you will be close to him, he's right there. If you will turn your back on him, he's still right there. Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is God's work. So here's what I'm saying. It is God's work when putting his love within us and perfecting his love. It's what God does, so we won't mess it up. Praise God. We can have confidence in that. 
Now I want to speak about the evidences of perfect love. The book of 1 John is a book of examination. He said, I've written these things unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now John knew when Jesus said there was coming a day that Jesus said many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and I, in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And John saw Jesus say that, and he said, I don't want that to happen to any of my flock. I want you to know that you have eternal life. I don't want you to get to that day and be surprised. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day. Many will be saying, Lord, Lord, I thought I was saved. And so John gave us evidence that we could examine to see. It offers evidence so that we can answer these questions. And if you look through here, you'll see all these questions are addressed. Do I know him? Am I in him? Is the love of the Father in me? Am I born of him? Have I seen him and do I know him? Have I passed from death to life? Am I of the truth? Is he dwelling in me and I in him? And it is his love perfected in me. It is imperative that you know this. Amen. Each of you, it's imperative that you know the answer to these questions. Is God in you? If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So how do I know if God is in me? What is the evidence for perfected love? I want to just briefly talk about the difference between evidence and means. Yes. The book of 1 John is a book of evidence. Jesus used this example. He said that the wind bloweth, whether it listeth. You hear the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. You don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. And so you see the evidence of the wind. When the wind blows, you see the leaves blow in the trees. But let me ask you something. Did I just make the wind blow through here? This is evidence of the wind. It's not the means to bringing the wind. If, I'm drive, if I see someone in a car traveling down the road, I have evidence, I have good evidence, there's gasoline in the car. Now you could push a car without gasoline, but not very far and not very fast. But I know that when so, a car is moving, there's gasoline in it. But let me tell you something, if I went and pushed my car, would I just fill up the tank? It is the evidence, it's not the means. So when we see here that the evidence is in 1 John, that God dwells in us if we do these things, can we just do them? And then, well, let me give you an example. It says, hereby, or brethren, let us love one another. That's a commandment. For love is of God, and everyone that's loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So if I look at that and say, well, I'm just going to go love someone, and then the love of God will be born in me. But you see that, when, that not everyone will be inclined to obey that command. That's right. And so already, when you have the inclination to obey this command, there's already evidence that God has already worked in your heart. I want to love my brother. Well, God put that in you to start. So it is God's work, and what we're looking at is the evidence of God's work. You can't just do in order to get the evidence. You, what, what, I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that we draw back to God, the source of the evidence. We draw to Him, and He works these things in us. 
So here are the three things that our passages were talking about to describe the love of God being perfected in us. First of all, we keep His Word. In Him verily is the love of God perfected. We love one another, secondly. And we have no fear of judgment. Or we have confidence before God. These are evidences that the love of God has completed its work in you. Now, the love of God doesn't stop there. It's got many other areas to work. But these are areas where it says the love of God is perfected in us. What is the proof of love? We know that faith wrought with Abraham's works, and by works was faith made perfect. By works, faith is made perfect or shown to be genuine. Yes. Faith is not complete without works because faith must find expression. Faith is only seen as it works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In the same way, love is perfected and shown to be genuine by works. Love is not complete without works because love must have expression. Love, like the wind, is only seen as it does something. So the first thing that is said that love is perfected in us is if we keep his word. If we keep his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Here we see the love of God is perfected by causing or compelling one to keep his word. We know that we know him when we see God's love working in us. And this working in us is not just secret hidden workings. God's love shows that it has been effective and has accomplished its purpose when someone keeps his commandments. The law could not have brought about this loyalty to God's word. Amen. And it is evidently and without question the working of God's love being perfected in us. So he compels us to keep his word. And as you have lack there, then the love of God is not perfected in you yet. The love of Christ constraineth us. This is why we keep his word, because we love him, and his love is in us. Amen. Think of love as a commandment. It sounds a little strange, doesn't it? But Jesus did give us the commandment that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. This is to be the primary characteristic of the church in the world. Amen. And what has become the primary characteristic of the church in the world? What denomination do you go to? Divisions. If you ask someone on the street, one of the primary things they think of when they think of the church is division. And Jesus said the primary thing that they should see is that you love one another. Amen. I know there must be heresies. But let us, let us let the love for one another just drown out all the divisions. This is a proof of discipleship, brethren, when we love one another. In John 15, Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue, continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now love is a command. A command will have an entirely different tone depending on the desires of the servant. Amen. So the apostles instructed Paul to remember the poor. He said, that was the very thing I was forward to do. They told me to do something I wanted to do. And this is the command of love. Love one another. Well, yes, that's what I want to do. Amen. Praise God. Give me another commandment like that. 
Well, you say we're not saved by keeping commandments. Well, we are saved by knowing the Lord Jesus, but don't disparage commandments unless you want to ignore much of the New Testament. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep them. You say, well, we can't keep all his commandments. Let me ask you one thing. What specific commandment are you directly rebelling against right now? And if you are, and your heart is right, won't you repent of it? You won't purposely continue in sin? God forbid. So keep his commandments. And this is a sign that his love is perfected in you. Jesus said to Simon, he said, do you love me? He said, feed my sheep. If you love him, you'll do what he says. Amen. The good ground were those which in an honest and a good heart, having heard the word, keep it. Yes. They keep it. Jesus said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. God wants us to keep his word. And Jesus spelled it all out when he said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, here's the evidence, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. I will manifest myself unto him. And he said further, he said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. Praise God for that. To the church in Philadelphia, Jesus said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hath kept my word. The believers are known for keeping God's word. Amen. And the church is identified as those who keep his commandments. Amen. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Amen. And here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. The believers are those that keep the commandments of God. So brethren, keep yourselves in the love of God. But there's a relationship here seen between love and commandment keeping. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so all other commandments are supported by and flow from this love. So the first uh, evidence that love is perfected in us is when we keep his word. And the second is when we love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. It's an evidence for you. It's a testimony to the world. It gives you confidence before God when you love the brethren. Well, let me tell you, when I was first born again, this didn't just automatically happen. I mean, God has to work this in us. Whoso hath his world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Peter said, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Amen. Fervently. You want to be zealous, be zealous in love. He also said, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Do you know that love is the antidote for sin? Yes. It just covers the multitude. You say, well, I've sinned a lot. Well, 
Love can take care of a multitude. Amen. The third thing that the love of God perfecting in us shows, it shows in the confidence that we have at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Boldness, it says, in the day of judgment. Well, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was afraid, and I hid. And this is the situation God is reversing in us. He promised us that without, we would serve him without fear all the days of our lives. The man who, in the parable of the pounds, who hid it, he said, I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. You cannot serve God with fear. You cannot have this distance relationship with God and be afraid of judgment and still have fellowship with him. And what I'm saying is this fear of this great and mighty, almighty God is just washed away by his love when he draws you close to himself Amen. and he makes you his child. But a person's attitude toward the day of judgment reveals whether love has been perfected in them. Who shall be able to stand? Think about the day of judgment. Think about the day of judgment. When they opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the fates of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Yes, and Jesus is going to shout like no other shout you've ever heard before. The shout of a king is among us. He's going to shout. And the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And this is going to be a terrifying time. And let me tell you what will, let me ask you, what will your response be? when you think about that great and dreadful day of the Lord, can you say, Lo, this is our God. Amen. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. Amen. This is our Lord. We have waited for Him. Amen. Praise God. And maybe you said praise God about the coming of the Lord many times, but maybe you've not really thought about what your heart said. Are you really ready for that day? Are you really sure? It's an amazing thing in Ephesians 3. It says that through Jesus in Him we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Here's where our confidence is. It is in Him. By faith in Him we have boldness and access with confidence. There was nothing like this under the old covenant. Now we have boldness to come into the Lord's presence. Even Moses said, I exceeding fear and quake. But we have boldness to enter in to his presence. Amen. Christ is a son over his house. Whose house are we if we hold the, begin the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm to the end? This is a requirement that you have confidence before God. Amen. You just can't muddle around thinking, well, I'm not sure if he accepts me or I'm not sure if I'm ready for the day of judgment. You've got to know. Amen. Yes. Amen. This is a requirement 
We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And the prayer for them is that they would show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We need full assurance, brethren. So as the climax of Hebrews comes to chapter 10 and verse 19, it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness. Boldness to enter into the holiest. Not just the outer court, not even the inner court. We have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Jesus, God is calling you to come up, draw near, Draw near. Can you hear God saying that to you today? Come up, draw near. Come away with me, my love. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Amen. In love, we identify with Christ and are no longer vessels of wrath. Because we are as he is, there can be no charge brought to our account. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justified. Amen. There is no condemnation. Perfect love casteth out fear, brethren. We have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And when God purifies your heart by faith and draws you to himself and confirms his love in you, then you can know that he is, that you, our spirit bears witness with, or his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He says, you're my son, and that gives you confidence in the day of judgment. Amen. And if you don't have that co confidence yet, I mean really, you don't have that confidence that God accepts you and loves you and welcomes you and there's no way you could come into judgment, then God's love has not been perfected in you yet and just cleave to him with purpose of heart. Yes. Yes. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear of judgment. When you love God and you know that he loves you, your fear is cast out. In Christ, we no more think that God would send judgment upon us than that he would reject the spotless offering of his own son. Lack of assurance here is nothing short of unbelief. Because God has said that he accepts you in Christ. And that there is no condemnation. And don't you believe it? Amen. Are you unsure about whether God loves you? Well, let me tell you what has happened. What has happened is that you've strayed too far from the cross. Amen. The cross of Jesus Christ is where God said to you, I love you. Amen. Amen. So what could separate us from the love of God? Well, you say, well, my sin. Are you willing to, are you content to live in your sin? Aren't you ready to repent and to know the love of God that passeth knowledge? Let me ask you some questions. Did God send his son into the world to condemn the world? Has not our Lord Jesus come to seek and to save that which was lost? And has he not put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? And did he not bear in his own body our sins on the tree? Yes. Haven't you heard that there's a fountain 
open for sin and uncleanness. And were not our transgressions removed from us as far as the east is from the west? Was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them? And was it for Abraham's sake alone that righteousness was imputed to him? Was he not delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification? Do we then have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens? And can he be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, having been tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin? And do we not now have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous? And if we confess our sins, well, is he not faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Well then, brethren, what, fear, what do we have with fear? What cause is there for fear? If you cleave to the Son of God, he has cast out fear by his love. What is the conclusion of the matter. God has drawn us with love and he's put his love within our hearts to transform us, to make us ready for heaven and to make us like worthy children of Jesus, of God, uh, sons and daughters of the most high God. He's put his love within us to change us. Well, is there still a question mark about God's love? You need to believe the word of God to the full assurance of faith. David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God will be with thee. He will not fail thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And God won't fail you, brethren, until he is finished and his love is perfected within you. And you have, you will keep his words, you'll love the brethren, and you'll have no fear of the day of judgment.